Café Scientifique is a monthly series of expert-led discussions on science and culture presented by the Bell Museum of Natural History. For more information about the Bell Museum or to find out about upcoming Café Scientifique programs, visit bellmuseum.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. How's everybody doing tonight? Excellent. Um, well, as I assume you know, we're gathered here tonight for a cafe called Invisible Architects. And it will be a scintillating talk revealing the weird underground world of mycorrhizal fungi. And maybe we will finally settle the debate whether it is fungi or fungi. <laughs> Depends on where you're from or fungi. Okay. <laughs> All right. So our trivia quiz tonight will primarily be a shrooming affair. Number one, true or false question. True or false, mushrooms are a member of the plant kingdom. Yes. That is not true. That is false. Correct. Correct. Absolutely. Yes. All right, well, just a, just a follow-up. Which kingdom are mushrooms a member of? That is correct. They are the fungi kingdom. They have their own kingdom. All right, so now that we've established that, the vegetative nutrient transferring part collect, of a fungus, rather, collectively is known as one, mycelium, two, hyphae, Hyphae. <laughs> Three, stalk, or four, spores. Yes. All right, this is kind of a trick question. Collectively. No. So this is the vegetative nutrient transferring part. Yes, Alexis. Yes, that is, well, no. <laughs> You're on the right track. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to say them out loud again, all right? Mycelium. <laughs> yes, I think that's what you meant, so let's call that good. <laughs> all right, so the largest fungal colony that we know of grows in the Blue Mountains of Oregon, and it's definitely one of, if not, uh, the largest organism on Earth, although we were trying to figure out what their measure for largest organism on Earth was, whether it was like biomass or distance covered or whatever. Uh, but we're going to talk about surface area here. So how many average sized suburban lots, which you can kind of picture, right, would you need to purchase in order to accommodate this gigantic fungus? Does that make sense? Okay. Would you have to buy 20 average suburban lots, 200 average suburban lots, 2,200 average suburban lots, or 6,200 average suburban lots to accommodate this fungus in Oregon? Yes, that is correct. Excellent, so 6,200 lots is correct. Um, and we were calculating that at each lot being about 0.35 acres per lot because um, that's what the Google said. And then uh, just to relate that to something we can maybe picture, that's about one-third of the suburban lots in Woodbury. So if you took one-third of Woodbury's residential area, then you would have the fungus. <laughs> Although the neighborhood probably wouldn't like that if you called it the fungus. <laughs> All right, it's a, cul -de -sac. It's a lovely cul-de-sac. All right, uh, let's see, number four. Which of the following is not a real name for a mushroom? I think we've done this one a few, uh, maybe a couple years ago when Cat Sweeney was here, but it's just a fun one. So this is, these are different, different challenge names, though. All right, not a real name of a fungus. The Snake Tongue Truffle Club. The Bearded Field Cup. The Star-Bellied Sneech or the pink disco. Right in the middle there. You're going with number three, the star-bellied sneech? That is correct. I was hoping I'd just throw you off because it seemed like no way. All right, number five. Which of the following is not a factual way to identify the difference between a real delicious morel mushroom or a false deadly morel mushroom? Okay, so three of these ways 
are ways that can hopefully help you make that identification. And one of these ways is not a way to tell the difference. And all of these ways should not be relied upon as the only ways in which you try to make that distinction between deadly mushrooms and edible mushrooms. So please look that up before you eat anything that you pick. All right, so true morels have a cap covered in pits and ridges while false morels look more wavy and lobed. All right, number two, the cap of a false morel opens at dawn and closes at dusk while the cap of the true morel stays open all the time. Three, the true morel is attached to the stem, the cap rather, is attached to the stem. The false morel has a cap that hangs freely off the stem. And four, the inside stem of a true morel is hollow while the inside of the false, false morel is filled with fibrous, fibers or chunks of tissue. Yes. Number three, that is uh, actually a correct true distinction between the true and false morale. Okay, so that rules out one. So we're down to pitted caps versus lobed caps. Yes. Number two, the cap of the fake morale opens and closes with dusk and dawn. That is correct. Yes. So yes, no such thing as the opening at dusk and dawn as far as the false morale is concerned. Which of the following is not a weird property that a real mushroom has? Okay, so I'm going to say three weird properties that are actual real mushroom properties and one that is not a real mushroom property. Okay, all right. Number one, the young fruiting bodies of the inedible Hydellum pecai fungi bleed a red pigment containing anticoagulant properties. Again, inedible. Don't eat that one. Okay. B, the edible fruiting body of the corp corprinus comatus dissolves itself within hours of depositing its spores or after being picked. Dissolves itself. Three, the germ of the parasitic casuta pentagona, pentag pentagona, pentagona uh, twirls through the air, sniffing volatile chemicals released by... Oh, let me take that back. I apologize. No, that's okay. The germ <laughs> twirls through the air, sniffing volatile chemicals released by neighboring plants in order to find a suitable host, inserts its nozzles into that host, and siphons off vital nutrients. And four, the spores of the Calbarista subsculpta form a mass called a glaba in the center of a stomach-like fruit body and escape in response to the impacts of falling raindrops. So we've got bloody, blood, bleeding mushrooms with anticoagulant properties. We've got dissolving mushrooms that dissolve after they fruit or after they deposit their spores. We've got a, a parasitic mushroom that smells out its host and then sticks its nozzles into it. <laughs> and we have the uh, one that doesn't have that collects its spores in its, its stomach-like center and then kind of spits them out when the rain hits it. Yes. Number three is the parasitic mushroom and you're saying that is not a mushroom? You are correct. That is not describing a mushroom. That is describing a plant in the Amazon. All right. Uh, what is the biggest source of greenhouse gas in the United States? A, farming, logging, and manufacturing. B, heating and cooling buildings, C, producing electricity, or D, using transportation? Yes. A, farming, logging, manufacturing is not the biggest producer. Biggest source of greenhouse gas, so we're, yes. That was my yes, and no, it is not, actually. Heating, uh, we have heating and cooling buildings or producing electricity. It is not heating and cooling of buildings. <laughs> Producing electricity is actually, and this is according to the Department of Energy website. Finally, which state has the highest energy related carbon dioxide emissions per capita? So carbon dioxide emissions per capita 
energy related. Wyoming, North Dakota, Florida, or California? It's not North Dakota. That was also my guess. <laughs> yes. It is Wyoming. Very good. Wyoming is the second largest energy producing state uh, after North Dakota, I believe. And it is, uh, but it has the least population and so it works out to be the highest producer per capita. All right. I'm going to introduce our host, or well, I guess I'm the host. I'll introduce our guest tonight. <laughs> Tonight's guest is Dr. Jeremiah Henning. His research has taken him from tropical rainforests and mountaintops to the Arctic tundra, permafrost, and tall grass prairies of the Midwest, all in pursuit of understanding biodiversity and how contemporary global change is reshaping it. Curiously enough, invisible soil-dwelling organisms called mycorrhizal fungi may hold the key. <laughs> I didn't have to spell it that time. <laughs> to how ecosystems will respond to a changing climate. Dr. Henning, who likes to be called Jeremiah, <laughs> is a postdoctoral associate in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Behavior at the University of Minnesota. He recently relocated back to the Midwest after completing his PhD at the University of Tennessee, and he continues his work in the tall grass prairies near Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And I'm pretty sure it's gonna be a great talk because there's already one empty beer and another full one all lined up on the stool. So let's give a big round of applause for Jeremiah Henning. All right, well, how's everybody doing tonight? Can everyone hear me all right? Good. All right, well, I just want to start out by, by first thanking Leah for such a great introduction, um, and thank you for organizing such a cool event, and thanks for inviting me to, to come and speak for it. Um, you kind of reminded me, though, that now I guess I've spent most of my adult life, um, over, over, I guess, 12, 13 years now, uh, thinking about this weird group of fungi that live somewhere between kind of um, the plant root and kind of the soil. And they're, they kind of live kind of cryptically, kind of um, very, hard to, very hard to see, right? And if you guys are anything like my, my parents or my family, you're probably thinking, why the hell would you spend your life thinking about these types of fungi? Uh, <laughs> And, and hopefully uh, through my talk, you'll, you'll, you'll discover why. I spend a lot of my time thinking about these fungi. Um, just a quick show of hands, has, has anyone ever heard of mycorrhizal fungi before coming to the door tonight? Whoa, that's, that's fantastic. That's, that's like 10 more people than I thought. I thought it was gonna be zero. Uh, so then I guess I don't work, have to work as hard tonight. Uh, so you know, first, I guess for the rest of you, I'll first introduce what the hell mycorrhizal fungi are, why they're important, and how, and then hopefully how they may kind of mediate or mitigate some of the, the effects that ecosystems are gonna see with climate change. Before I really get started, <coughs> I need to, <coughs> to send some, to say some thank yous to a lot of folks that have contributed to the work that I'm gonna to present tonight. Um, science is not a, a, a single endeavor, but it's, you know, it's, it's done through heavy collaboration and a whole, a whole team of, of really great folks. And uh, obviously I have to thank a lot of really great funding sources, and so there's been a lot of, a lot of places that have given me money to study these weird, uh, weird fungi, and so I'm very thankful for them to, that they've made this work possible. <clears throat> And so this is, this is a, a pretty characteristic uh, kind of landscape you might see around uh, just outside of the Twin Cities, right? So this is a kind of picturesque tall grass prairie ecosystem. And when I look at this ecosystem, I see a lot of things that make it really, really special, right? So first off, we know that the tall grass prairie ecosystem hosts a, a huge amount of plant biodiversity, right? And so if you go out into a prairie in midsummer, uh, you can see tons and tons of different plant species. And then associated with all those different plant species, you see a tremendous amount of insects and different animals that are living within those, those diverse plant communities. Um, but I guess to me, what, what really makes these, these tall grass prairie ecosystems really, really special is the fact that they are some really beautiful uh, areas that store just a ton of carbon, right? And so maybe that's not what you think about when you see a tall grass prairie, is their ability to store carbon. Um, but, you know, um, 
carbon storage is, is, a, is a really important component, right? So if you, if you see these uh, kind of tall grass prairie plant species, uh, you can see them kind of growing up one to two-ish, three feet tall, right? Maybe, maybe some plant species get about four or five feet tall. But below ground, these plants penetrate six to 10 feet below the soil surface, right? So in the soil, these, these plants are putting a tremendous amount of carbon. And, and you can see that carbon, right? So in areas now in, that were once tall grass prairie are now turned into agriculture, right? So you can see the, in areas of, of heavy agriculture the, that really beautiful characteristic kind of black uh, soil in a lot of, a lot of farm lands that really has that really nice kind of earthy smell. Uh, it's black because the amount of, of carbon that's, that's put within those soils, right? And, and most of the tall grass prairie that we have has been converted to agricultural land because it's, it's very fertile and very great. Um, but I guess more importantly, um, you know, the tall grass prairie as in most ecosystems on the face of the earth are under threat, right? And so we know that around the globe that, that things are changing, right? So we know that we're, we're converting large swaths of land, especially the tall grass prairie, into, into uh, agricultural space, right? And in those agricultural spaces, we're, we're converting, you know, once was grasslands into these kind of uh, flat, open kind of dirt spaces that we plant monoculture crops on. We dump excessive amounts of nutrient fertilizers in that space. Additionally, we are burning a ton of, of fossil fuels, uh, which are adding to the amount of, of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, uh, which are uh, raising global temperatures on average about one, one-ish degree uh, over the last 100 years. Um, and that's, that temperature increase is, is projected to go anywhere from about two to four degrees on average. <clears throat> and that raising temperature is, is kind of changing the, the precipitation patterns around the globe, right? So areas that maybe once had these nice swimming areas um, are now kind of drying out as the, these areas are getting hit with prolonged drought. On the flip side of that, there's areas that are getting more kind of excessive extreme rain events that now are kind of turning into these kind of flash flood zones, right? So around the Twin Cities, that's kind, of, that's kind of what we're seeing, right? So we're seeing these kind of catastrophic kind of flash flood uh, rain events um, due to climate change. Uh, we also know that we're, we're cutting down a lot of forest as we're kind of converting a lot of these, these forest lands uh, from, from nice plant communities into agriculture um, or uh, we're converting them to kind of these uh, urban centers. And so a lot of these urban centers, we're, we're kind of losing uh, kind of that plant cover. And we're, we're seeing a lot more just human, human activity on the landscape, right? So kind of all these things are kind of hitting our different ecosystems kind of simultaneously. Uh, and so it's kind of a, a kind of a bleak picture, um, and and so I guess this is kind of the doom and gloom portion of my talk, um, but hopefully I'll, I'll I'll pull out of that in a second. Um, and so organisms on the landscape have a few different ways that they can respond to global change, right? So thinking of of how these these trees may may respond in this desert, they can kind of hang out and cope, right? They can kind of wait. Uh, kind of hunker down their, their activity and just kind of wait it out until organisms or the, the, the climate comes back to a better, a better, more kind of conducive habitat for them to grow. Uh, organisms can move, right? So we see, we're seeing this within the, within around the globe too. So plants are kind of starting to shift their populations away from the equator and moving towards kind of the poles. Uh, plants on the sides of mountains are kind of drifting up the sides of the mountains as they're, they're trying to kind of track their historic climates on the, uh, in, on the landscape. Uh, plants can also adapt, and animals can also adapt too, so they can change when they're, when they're living, right? So plants are able to maybe flower earlier in the growing season, or they're able to grow green out a, a few weeks earlier, uh, or maybe they're able to kind of train, change their traits and how they're, how they're living on the, the landscape. Um, or 
or they are not. Um, and we know that there's a lot of organisms that are going extinct. Um, and so uh, biodiversity is, is kind of doing any one of these given things in, in most ecosystems, which is resulting in a lot of changes in biodiversity. It's leading to a lot of changes into the different organisms that are living within uh, ecosystems. <clears throat> And we know that the ecosystems themselves uh, are, are adapting. Um, and so I'm gonna take this back to more of a carbon kind of heavy kind of framework from what I presented within what makes, what makes the, the prairie special. Um, and so to, to think about how ecosystems, kind of that larger scale, are responding to global change, I'm gonna kind of walk you through a little bit of very elementary carbon cycle, global carbon cycle. <clears throat> right, and so this is our ecosystem. Uh, we have a whole bunch of plants in that ecosystem, and we have a whole bunch of, of, of roots and, and soil below. And we know that across the, the landscape, uh, across the globe, we have a tremendous amount of carbon being stored within plant biomass, right? So across the globe, if we could weigh every single plant that lives on Earth, it would weigh something like 550 gigatons. Um, uh, a gigaton is a billion tons. I don't know what that means. Does that, I, that, that makes no, I have no like reference point to that. And so the next biggest organ, the biggest organism I could think of when I was, when I was trying to think uh, was an elephant. Uh, so we know an elephant weighs about Seven, seven metric tons, a little shy of that. And so if we put the amount of total plant biomass in terms of, of elephants, uh, we would have about 81 million elephants worth of plant biomass on the face of the earth at any given time. That's a lot of elephants. Um, maybe, maybe if elephants aren't, aren't your thing, another example, anyone know what this building is? is yep, it's Empire State Building. So Empire State Building weighs about 365,000 tons. Um, so in, in plant biomass, uh, that would be about 15 million uh, Empire State Buildings worth of, of plant biomass on the landscape. That's a, that's a crap ton of, of carbon as, as, um, uh, as plant biomass, right? <clears throat> but we also know that we have a tremendous amount of carbon in the atmosphere Right, so the atmosphere contains about 800 uh, gigatons of carbon. So that's more, more carbon is, is stored within the atmosphere than we have within plant biomass. And we know that, that carbon goes from the atmosphere into plant biomass um, through photosynthesis every single year, right? So we know that about 120 gigatons of carbon moves from the atmosphere into, into green leaf tissues. But we know at the end of every fall, those leaves die, they senesce, right? And they drop back to the landscape. And so they are respired by the different bacteria and fungi um, that live at the soil surface. And that is about half of the carbon goes straight back away to that, that, that atmosphere. The other half of, of the plant biomass goes below ground and is stored as carbon in, into the soil. Right, so that's about the other, the other 60 gigatons. Um, and it contributes to the soil carbon pool, which is 2,300 gigatons of carbon. So uh, that's a lot more, there's a lot more carbon being stored in the soil than there is in both the atmosphere and, the, and, the, and that's was stored within the plants combined, right? So 2,300 gigatons of carbon, uh, that's 350, ele 350 million elephants are stuffed into the soil, um, or 60 million Empire State Buildings. So a lot more carbon than in the soil than is uh, in the atmosphere or in, the, in, in, the, in plants. But we also know that every year that, um, that root and microbial respiration uh, and decomposition breaks down a lot of that carbon and it goes back into the atmosphere. So if we kind of take that kind of the net carbon flux that goes from the atmosphere into the plants, into the soil, and then back again, it's about a net effect of zero, right? So it's about 
uh, 60 and 60 coming out, 120 going in. So it's about a, a zero effect. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we know that you know, we've done a lot, we do a lot of things in cities, right? And we, so burning fossil fuels, our use of cement, our land use change um, adds about nine gigatons of carbon back to the atmosphere per year. That doesn't seem like a lot. Nine gigatons in relevance to 800, our 550, our 2300 is not very much. But when you, when you think about that into the reference of a net zero, it's just, it's just gaining carbon back to the atmosphere here. So we're only seeing that movement back to the atmosphere. And this is why people like me and other climate scientists are very terrified by ongoing climate change. But I guess, you know, silver lining kind of thing, uh, we know that our rate, our, the rise we've already seen in global CO2 does increase uh, photosynthesis. Um, unfortunately, we only see about three more gigatons uh, of carbon moving into, um, into, into plant tissue through photosynthesis per year. So we're still at a, a six gigaton deficit to the atmosphere a year. And this is why we're seeing such a, a, a quick increase in, in the CO2 within our atmosphere. It's because of, of that addition, that small addition is, has pretty big effects long term. <clears throat> and, and I guess what keeps me up at night, um, and a lot of climate scientists probably also, is that the, the movement from plants um, to the carbon or to the soil, and then the soil back out to the atmosphere uh, in a warmer kind of uh, precipitation changed regime is really unknown. We really don't know how these feedbacks are going to be affected by a warmer climate or a climate with more water. And so these unknowns are, are kind of scary. If we start kind of ramping this up, uh, we could see a, an acceleration of the CO2 that's being contributed back to the atmosphere. Okay, so now that everyone's in a pretty dark place, um, I'm gonna try to bring us back out. Because what if, what if there were some organisms that existed that could simultaneously maintain plant biodiversity they could increase plant productivity, and they could increase the level of storage of carbon in ecosystems. That would be pretty rad, right? We have them. Our muscular mycorrhizal fungi, right? And so these are the fungi that I spend way too much of my time thinking about. And um, these fungi, um, to kind of give you a little kind of introduction of what they are, uh, so these, these fungi are part of the phylum glomeromycota. It's kind of a sister clade to kind of the mushroom, the mushroom forming fungi that you may be more familiar with, the basidiomycetes. They're kind of a, an ancient sister, sister clade. And these fungi don't produce uh, mushrooms, but they produce these, these very beautiful uh, asexual spores. And so this is a kind of a mixed bag of probably 30, 40 different fungal species. Um, you can see very different sizes, colors, and, and kind of shapes within their, within their spores. But I guess a little more information of what they are. And so these fungi live in the roots of almost every single land plant, right? So 85% of all plant species contain these fungi. And so basically anything herbaceous will have AMF in their roots. And, and most trees, about half of trees, have AMF in their roots. Uh, and they live between, just I kind of let the cat out of the bag on that one, uh, they live halfway between uh, plant roots and in the soil. And so I kind of have this cartoon here. Uh, so you can see uh, fungi kind of setting up shop within the plant root here. Um, and within, between the space, between the, the plant epidermis and the vascular tissue, which runs in the middle, and then they, they leave the root and they kind of live out in soil space. Once they're in the soil space, these fungi are really, really efficient at gaining nitrogen and phosphorus. And they translocate that, that phosphorus and nitrogen back to the plant. And in return, these fungi receive a ton of sugar from the plant, right? So plants are paying these fungi for the nitrogen and phosphorus that they provide. In return, plants are giving sugar. So plants are giving about, some plant species give up about 
20% of all the carbon that they fix through photosynthesis straight away to these fungi. So these fungi can be a tremendous carbon sink for the plant, but in areas where there's very low nutrients available to them, they have to, otherwise they can't survive. Um, these fungi also uh, are really good at translocating water to a host plant too. Um, and in addition to the nutrient end, um, these fungi also protect plants against pathogens. Uh, they're really great for helping plants just kind of cope with kind of drought stress. Um, if things try to eat plants, uh, they help kind of plants kind of maintain and kind of live through some of that, that biotic stress as well. And one of the, the cool things I think about these, plant, or these fungi is that this is an ancient symbiosis between plants and fungi. And so these, these fungi have been around and have been associating with plants as long as plants have been living on land. And so the original plants that were colonizing land uh, from water environments had these pretty weak kind of um, primitive root systems that they really couldn't pull nutrients from the soil. And without these fungi, um, they wouldn't have been able to kind of survive on land. And so these fungi are, are pretty important. You know, their they're life, life of plants wouldn't be, wouldn't be possible without them. So really they, they, run, they run plants. <clears throat> and you know, in addition to all the effects that they have for an individual, um, I think what really got me excited about these fungi when I was an undergraduate student um, was the effects that they have at um, kind of the ecosystem or at the community, kind of larger spatial scales. And so when I was an undergrad, I read this, this really highly influential paper by this Dutch researcher uh, and his team of, of researchers, Marcel van der Heiden. And what they were interested in is learning, um, I didn't show up well, um, the, the number of, of total fungi within the ecosystem. So they added, the, they built these systems with a varying number of, of fungal species. From, so from zero to one, two, four, uh, eight, up to, up to 16 uh, fungal species. And then in these, in these ecosystems, they seeded plants and to, to measure how much plant biodiversity that these different fungi were able to support. Right? So they were looking for the relationship between the amount of fungi in the ecosystem and the level of plant diversity that they could observe. And they found this really highly positive relationship between the number of fungi and plant diversity. So more fungi led to more plants. <clears throat> Additionally, they were also interested in knowing how the number of fungi in the system um, kind of helped the total amount of plant biomass or plant productivity in that ecosystem, right? So if we could maximize plant productivity, we could see more kind of more carbon being pulled into that, that, green, that green box. And when they looked at that relationship, they found a very similar positive relationship between the number of fungi and the amount of plant productivity in that system. So again, we see this more fungi, more plants kind of relationship. At the same time that van der Heiden and his group were, were doing their work and within fungal diversity, there was another group that was looking at um, the ability of these fungi to shape uh, soil carbon storage. And so what they did is they measured this special fungal protein called glomalin um, in the soil. And so you could think of this as um, more fungi are gonna produce more of this protein in general. And then they were looked at the stability of carbon, our soil aggregates, right? So the more kind of sticky, kind of um, clustered the, the soil carbon aggregates are, or soil aggregates were, um, the more kind of, um, kind of the better structure your soil has, right? And so uh, they also found this positive relationship. So more, more fungi in the system led to more stability of soil aggregates. So we had this relationship, more fungi, more carbon, right? And so this kind of kicked into this, into high gear, this kind of quick literature of, of people investigating uh, AMF and, and really pointed to the, the critical role of AMF have in the maintenance of plant diversity, plant productivity, and the stabilization of soil carbon. <clears throat> And so this kind of leads me to the kind of the question of the night, 
Um, do AMF kind of mediate plant biodiversity and ecosystem level responses to global change? <clears throat> and I'm going to attack this in, in two, different, two different pieces, right? So first I'm going to kind of concentrate on this ability of AMF to mediate plant biodiversity responses to uh, global change drivers. And then I'm going to kind of come at it from a second view and thinking about how AMF may mediate ecosystem level responses to global change. <clears throat> and so for this first question, uh, I'm gonna kind of concentrate on that, uh, the ability of AMF to kind of mediate the diversity and productivity uh, in the face of, of global change drivers. One very important global change driver um, that I worked on and is a global change driver in this area is nitrogen, right? And so this, this map is a, a map of nitrogen deposition across the globe in the year 2000. And so we can see our nice little spot here in the Midwest. Um, we're, in the, we're in the high zone, right? So we are dumping a ton of nitrogen into our ecosystems, right? Most of this is coming from, what do you think? Manure, yeah, so it's agriculture, right? And you can see in areas, almost every area of the world, right? So Europe is dumping a ton of nitrogen, Asia, uh, Central Africa, and huge chunks of, of South America too. And so this is a pretty common, pretty common thing anywhere that there's a lot of agriculture, that we're, we're seeing a lot of nitrogen being de deposited. <clears throat> And so when I started thinking about that relationship that, that van der Heiden found, he found this very positive relationship between diversity and productivity with the amount of fungi in the system. And so I immediately started thinking about, you know, opposite both ends of this spectrum. And so, you know, at areas of, of low fungal diversity and areas of high fungal diversity, what do we see when we start adding nitrogen into these ecosystems? And so this is kind of the way I, I, the question I kind of tested, right? And so to do this, I went to this, I reconstructed this prairie um, near Eau Claire, actually, um, in which we, we seeded in very, uh, diff a number of different plant species, right? So we want, we're interested in also kind of accounting for some of the plant biodiversity differences, right? And so we went from these very simple kind of, kind of plant systems where we only had six different plant species all the way to these more complex systems with, with 30 plant species. And so each of these nine seeding treatments was replicated five times for 45 total plots. Each of these plots was then split. And then in half of those plots, I added nitrogen to kind of knock out the AMF community in those plots, uh, right? So then we could, and then on the other half of the plots, uh, I overlaid a nitrogen addition. So then um, it looked something like that. Um, so then um, I could do comparisons to look at how AMF mediated nitrogen response of the plant community by con comparing this, this non-fungicided nitrogen to the control and these, these fungicide with nitrogen to the fungicide without nitrogen. All right, does that make sense? <clears throat> All right, no? Yeah, yeah. A forb, okay, so that's basically um, most green things that you can think of that are not grasses. Yeah. Yeah. What's a fungicide? Um, oh, so that's a, that's a chemical, yeah, that's a great question. So that's a, a chemical that just kills fungi. Okay. Yeah, so we... It's not nitrogen. Nope, it's not nitrogen. So we, yeah, we overlaid nitrogen um, with, with a fungicide treatment. So we just wanted to knock out all the fungi in that ecosystem, and we wanted to see how that, the, the presence of fungi or the absence of fungi mediated plant responses to nitrogen. Yeah. Are fungicides used in commercial agriculture? Yes, they are, absolutely. Yes, yeah, so they're mostly used as foliar uh, on the leaves. Yeah. So does that affect Yes, it does. Um, but w there's a lot more things that, that disrupt the mycorrhizal in, in agricultural systems. So um, dumping in nitrogen hurts, but plowing every year uh, disrupts the, the fungal, kind of the, the structure of the fungi in the soil. And so fungicides hurt, are really hurt, but the, 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 just the, 
yearly tilling that we do in systems knock out these fungi, unfortunately. All right, so, so we, then we had these comparisons. Um, and so then I just, it was allowed me to ask this question, do AMF buffer plant biodiversity in response to nitrogen? Right, and so I'm gonna show a bunch of figures that look like the, oh yeah, one more question. What was your nitrogen addition? Was it biological nitrogen or were you using anhydrous nitrogen? Uh, we used um, uh, just common, the common, um, oh man, I'm totally blanking on the name, um, ammonium nitrate okay. fertilizers. Um, so I'm gonna show a bunch of figures that look like this, right? So where we see, um, so this is always gonna be a comparison against the control. And so it's just basically subtracting the, the control from the, the community with nitrogen added, right? So it's just gonna be a difference. And then I'm gonna have AMF present or AMF pres uh, absent. So the zero line would be that biodiversity was the same in in nitrogen or non-nitrogen added plots. Um, anything above that line is that we gain plant species when we add nitrogen. Um, anything below that white line is gonna be, we're losing plant species when we add nitrogen into that ecosystem. All right, so when we have AMF present and we douse these, these plant communities with nitrogen, uh, we lose um, on average about three plant species on, on average. Um, and this is, this is pretty common. We know that this happens. This is kind of a long history of, of kind of been find, found in, in um, kind of the, the agricultural literature. When you add nitrogen, you lose plant species, you lose plant diversity. <clears throat> uh, and so nitrogen addition causes, lo causes the loss of biodiversity. But when we knock out AMF, and we measure plant response to, to nitrogen addition, we actually find that we lose more biodiversity when we remove these fungi. And so it doesn't look like much, um, and it's this difference between three and four species, right? Um, and so we're only losing one more species, but I should mention that um, the overall species number in these plots, although we seeded up to 30 species in these plots, um, the most that we had were about eight to 15 species on average in each of these plots. And so three to four, if we're losing three to four species in these plots, that could be almost half of the biodiversity in these plots. So kind of sad. Uh, but AMF kind of helped buffer that, maybe just a little bit, but they, they're buffering it a little bit. <clears throat> so maybe AMF dampen uh, biodiversity losses in response to nitrogen. And so next, I was interested in thinking about the biodiversity or the productivity um, response to, to nitrogen. Again, we're gonna have a very similar looking figure uh, where we, now we have just change in plant productivity um, on, on our y-axis here. And again, anything above this, this zero is gonna be productivity gain with nitrogen or we're gonna have productivity loss with nitrogen. <clears throat> And so when we, when we have AMF present, we actually see no change in plant productivity in that ecosystem. That's good, we're, we're maintaining the amount of plant biomass that's in that system. However, when we knock out AMF, uh, we actually see a decline in plant productivity in that ecosystem. And so removing AMF in that system or removing some of that biodiversity of AMF um, has, pretty, has pretty bad in, uh, effects on plant productivity. And kind of, to kind of relativize that, um, that productivity re reduction is about 50%. So we're losing about half of the plant productivity in that system. <clears throat> and so AMF are able to, to really buffer plant productivity in response to, to nitrogen addition. Okay, to kind of wrap that, that first piece up, uh, fungi control plants, which is pretty obvious, um, but um, kind of a little more deeper, uh, that fungal biodiversity buffers plant diversity, maybe a little bit, uh, but really seems to buffer plant, plant productivity responses to, to nitrogen addition here. Question? Yeah. Um, that, the conclusion I would draw there is um, nitrogen addition is not a good thing in general. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that's counterintuitive. I mean, how, what explains that? Gotta sell nitrogen. What's that? Gotta sell the fertilizer. 
Yeah, well, so most people aren't dumping nitrogen in. Um, most people are using it in agricultural settings. And so when you're dumping nitrogen, if you knock out AMF and you're growing um, crop plants, crop plants are really responsive and increase their productivity with nitrogen addition. And so this is, these are kind of these natural systems where they're probably only really seeing the runoff, right? So this, these are these natural areas that may be really affected in areas next to heavy agricultural fields, which, which are the, the few remnant prairies that exist um, on the landscape. Um, yeah. Herbicides have some effect. Do you study any of that? Um, I don't. I, I, I haven't done any herbicides. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, so now to kind of move into that, that second question here, um, how do AMF kind of mediate the ecosystem response to global change? And so um, because I really like nitrogen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with, with nitrogen as my global change driver again. Um, and I just want to flip up that map again. Uh, nitrogen is a big problem globally, right? So anywhere, um, any basic, almost every continent has a nitrogen deposition problem. Um, but we also are seeing a lot of biodiversity responses, right? So I showed in that first part that when we add nitrogen, we see a lot of biodiversity loss. And so now for this, the second piece, I want to kind of tease apart this, the effects of nitrogen from the effects of, of biodiversity loss here. <clears throat> and, and to kind of get back into the doom and gloom a little bit and thinking about biodiversity losses. Um, so this is, this is a map of biodiversity loss since the year 1500, and the colors are a little, little bit skewed here, um, but um, so blue equals areas that have lost a ton of plant biodiversity. So anywhere you see blue, the really light, the lightest colors of blue can be losses of about 20 to, to 30 percent of all their plant biodiversity. And so you can see, you know, areas, it happens to coincide with areas of heavy agricultural use, right? So Midwest here, most of Europe, uh, large swaths of Central Africa have lost a tremendous amount of plant biodiversity. Um, if we add all that up on the face of the globe, uh, we, we see that there's a 14% loss of the global biodiversity uh, since 1500. So that's about the time of industrial revolution. Right, uh, it's more doom and gloom, and so we know that we've lo in a lot of areas we've lost a tremendous amount of of plant biodiversity because of agricultural activity, and we know moving forward that there's going to be a lot more uh, kind of doom and gloom, and there's going to be a lot more um, kind of ecosystem responses to global change. Um, so this is a figure that NASA did a few years ago, kind of highlighting some of the, the areas and the ecosystems that they kind of deemed as sensitive. Um, interesting to me, the areas that are sensitive in, to NASA's um, kind of projection into the future are different from the areas that have been impacted to date. Um, because now these are areas that aren't really farmed, and so they, they have really haven't lost their a lot of biodiversity through agricultural practices yet, but they're going to lose a lot in the face of warming, precipitation regimes, changes, um, a lot of those other kind of contemporary global change drivers. And kind of to me, the thing that really sticks out to me is the, the loss, uh, the importance, and the, the sensitivity of, of boreal, so really northern, and mountain ecosystems. And so to kind of, to, to kind of jump ahead and to think about that, I'm gonna transition from these, these tall grass prairies in the Midwest, and I'm gonna jump into some of the work I've done in montane meadows uh, around the globe, but I'm gonna focus in on some work that I did in Colorado. <clears throat> and so kind of a quick little intro into why, why mountain ecosystems are in peril. Uh, <laughs> Um, so we know that, that plants are responding to, to warmer temperatures, right? So if we, if we have this warming event that happens, and so we have this very angry sun, um, we know that, that plants that are existing at the low end of the mountain are moving, and they're moving to higher elevations. Plants that are at those mid elevations are moving higher, right, all the way up. And so the most sensitive uh, species are these, these these species at the top of the mountain. So they're already in a range that is 
pretty limited, um, and they're, they're, they have a very kind of reduced kind of geographic range. Um, and if we keep warming it, they're just gonna, they're, they're gonna run out of space that they can go up. Um, they hit the top of the mountain, and they really can't exist in, 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 warmer, in warmer temperatures. And a lot of, we're seeing this in a lot of animal communities as well. <coughs> and so to remind you of that question, do AMF mediate ecosystem level responses to nitrogen change or nitrogen addition and plant loss. And so for this work, um, I I'm, I'm actually did a couple different nitrogen additions, right? So I added a, uh, I went to this Mount Montane ecosystem in Colorado and I started adding organic nitrogen um, to some plots. And then in other plots, I added this inorganic addition. And so I did these different forms of nitrogen uh, because plants differ in their ability to use different forms of nitrogen. Some plants are better at, at grabbing um, inorganic forms of nitrogen. Some plants are able to grab organic forms of, of nitrogen. And the fungi themselves also differ in their ability to, to, to access these different forms of nitrogen in the system. And then to, to simulate uh, biodiversity losses on the landscape, I pulled out my scissors and I went through these ecosystems and I chopped out all the dominant species in the system. And so in this system, it was this big bunch grass that I just chopped out with the scissors and then see, wanted to see what happens when we, when we cut out those plants. <clears throat> And then in, these, in each of these plots, I, I measured a whole bunch of, of response variables from the fungi to the plants and some of the carbon storage in these, in these systems. <clears throat> um, but I think as a, as a good lead in, I kind of have to start with the fungi, right? So I've been talking a lot about fungi. And so I have to start on how nitrogen affects fungi. Right, so this was something I ignored in the, the first part of my talk, right? So we just dumped fungicide on the plots to, to knock out all the fungi. And here we were interested in how the biodiversity of fungi and the abundance of fungi in the soil uh, responded to nitrogen addition themselves. And so when we did that, um, we I installed these um, kind of mesh bags into the soil. And so these mesh bags allowed fungal hyphae to grow in from the soil. Um, into the bags, and then after a year, I just come out, pull these bags out, and measure all the fun fungal biomass that grew into these bags over the year. Um, and it gives me a measure of how much uh, fungal biomass is in, in those ecosystems, right? So this, we could kind of scale this up to kind of ecosystem level and soil carbon storage as well. And so um, I'm gonna show a quick figure. So this is gonna be fungal biomass in the soil on the Y, and we're gonna have our different nitrogen here. And I found when we dumped tons of nitrogen on the systems, it really didn't affect the fungi that were in those systems. It was, it was actually pretty shocking. We thought that, that nitrogen was gonna just knock these fungi out. They seemed to be pretty resistant. And so they were able to kind of resist the effects of nitrogen in the system. <clears throat> Um, but then I wanted to, to kind of understand what removing all the dominant plant species did in, to the amount of fungi living in these soils, right? So you would think that if you chopped out half of the biomass in each of these plots, it would, it's the, that changes the amount of carbon that is going to these fungi, probably would probably have a bet, pretty bad effect for the fungi. But when uh, we measured the amount of biomass in these removals and not removals, we found that it didn't matter. Um, there was still the same amount of fungi in these ecosystems. And so these AMF seem to be resilient um, to plant removals in this ecosystem. And so if, if maybe if AMF are resistant and resilient to nitrogen and dominant removal, maybe that could kind of segue into how ecosystems are gonna to respond to nitrogen and plant removal. <clears throat> and so then we wanted to think about some of these ecosystem level responses and how we measured this was uh, soil carbon efflux. So the amount of CO2 that was coming from uh, the, the soil and is being respired back into the atmosphere, right? So it's the, the pool going from the soil back to the atmosphere again. And so that's just measured as soil efflux here. And we measured it across three different years. And uh, in response to nitrogen, 
we really see that nitrogen has no overall effect on the amount of, of soil carbon efflux. Uh, we, there's change across growing seasons. Uh, so 2013 was a, a significant drought year, uh, but 2014 and 2015, they were fine. It was, it was more wet years. There was a lot more snowfall in the mountains. Um, and so, but it didn't really matter um, whether or not these, these, these uh, soils had a bunch of nitrogen dumped on them. They, are, they were all respiring at about the same level, um, which we kind of anticipated that dumping nitrogen was gonna give more kind of growth uh, to the bacteria and the fungi in that system. Um, but uh, soil respiration seemed to be really resistant to nitrogen in that system. <clears throat> And then um, to kind of think about kind of the functional component of the plant community, we were interested in to understand how plant communities kind of recovered from cutting out these dominant plants, right? <clears throat> and so if we go in and we cut plant species out, how are the, these communities gonna respond, right? And so how I'm gonna measure this is gonna be this kind of relative change again, right? And so. Um, we're measuring the, this, so this is kind of a, a functional thing. Uh, so, <laughs> so we're interested in what we did is we went and measured all the traits of all the plants that lived in each of one of those plots. And, <clears throat> and that gave us kind of this kind of functional kind of breakdown of, of what the plant community, how it, how it kind of works. And so we kind of had two different hypotheses. So the recovery could just be every plant species that's in those plants or in those plots just kind of grows and everything gets bigger, right? And so if the dominant species is just really different from all the other plant species in that plot, we should see a line that looks like this, right? So we cut everything out at year zero and then we just see nothing really happening. All the plants that are there just kind of grow and kind of do their thing everything is, is kind of the same. Um, or we could see the, the flip side is maybe the dominant plant species had some kind of special characteristic about it that allowed it to be the dominant plant species, right? And so maybe the species that are most closely kind of resemble that species will be the species that kind of take over, right? So in, in, our, in our field, we cut out grass. And so maybe all the other grass species will compensate more so than the other species, right? So maybe there's something special in this ecosystem that allow grasses to, to grow fast. And if we, if we see that happening, we should see this line that when we cut it, it the, the function changes rapidly, but over time, so year one to year two, year three to year four, we see this slow kind of convergence back to the starting place, right? <clears throat> And so when we, when we measured this, this kind of the plant recovery and the plant response, we, that's exactly what we found. So we found that species that were more similar to our big dominant plant kind of slowly recovered um, back to, back to the, the original, or closer to the original plant community. And we knew that the, 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 the dominant plant species in this, um, in this field had some kind of, they were these big kind of grasses and we saw a recovery of all the grasses in this, in this, in this system. And so plants, uh, we kind of termed that this, the plant communities themselves were resilient to dominant plant species because we had this similar plants kind of filling in the empty gaps of, of where they were, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? It's kind of complex, um, cool. All right, so to kind of wrap that, that ecosystem kind of... Question? Yeah. Clarify. Yeah, yeah. When you went in and removed, you didn't just cut off the um, foliage. Mm -hmm. You dug the plants out. Uh, no, we didn't, we didn't cut the plants out or pull the plants out. We just cut the tops off. So why didn't they grow back from their roots? Uh, cause, so we, we applied a little bit of, of Roundup to them so they didn't grow well, back. <laughs> yes, yeah, we killed the whole plant, but we just didn't dig it out. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because you didn't want to disturb the soil structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would have been pretty catastrophic. So especially in these montane systems, the plants above ground are only about this tall, but they might go like 10 feet below ground. And so to try to get those roots out would be, would be impossible. So we just, we just round up, paintbrushed a little roundup after we scissors cut them out.
very tedious. <clears throat> okay, so to kind of wrap that, that part up, so we found that fungal biomass was resistant to nitrogen addition and resilient to plant losses. Um, soil respiration uh, was resistant to nitrogen addition and at the, the kind of the functional kind of plant community response was resilient to, to, to plant losses. And so it seems, to, it's this kind of this really fun, kind of nice story and this nice correlation that we see the fungal communities kind of stay in place when we, we bombard them with nitrogen and we cut out their host. And then we see this really nice recovery of the ecosystem, um, the plants, um, and, and the, the lack of change within the, the respiration. And so maybe AMF uh, can kind of, um, maybe AMF can kind of buffer entire ecosystems to global change. Um, but you know, this is, this is kind of a preliminary pattern. And so there's, there's a lot of really nice correlations here, um, but we don't really know if, if AMF are causing this. And so maybe this is kind of a tease, um, but it's kind of a, a preliminary pattern that we're seeing. And so I think follow-ups are kind of be kind of digging a little bit deeper to see if maybe if AMF really can, or the fungi can really buffer ecosystems against global change. We'll see. I'll keep you guys updated. <clears throat> All right. So. <clears throat> I'm going to go back to the doom and gloom picture again, right? So we know that we're bombarding ecosystems with a tremendous amount of global change drivers, right? And you, you may be kind of wondering that big, the big question. So will these weird soil-dwelling fungi save us from all these things? It would be nice, right? It would be really nice. But, you know, to be honest, no. It's these, these fungi might be able to help buffer the response and might be able to help us for a little bit, right? But, but we can't just keep doing all these things and just hope that the fungi are gonna save us, right? And so it's gonna take, it's gonna take active participation on our part. It's gonna take active participation on our part to, to bombard the, our you know, council people and our, you know, our, our government officials to kind of get real policies in place. Um, I'm not sure if any of you kind of saw this come out last week. Um, so this was a, a paper that uh, was a 25 year anniversary of the first world uh, notice or the first notice of world scientists warning to humanity. And so last week, I guess it was a week and a day ago now, um, the second notice came out. And uh, I guess what I thought was really interesting um, about this, this second warning is that over 15,000 scientists from around the globe from 184 different countries have signed on to support this letter or this paper, right? Issuing this, this monumental warning to humanity about how we need to change our ways and the, we need to step up to the plate. And so even, even in our country, even though this is a, a pretty uh, politicized issue uh, globally, this isn't, this isn't a politicized issue. This is everyone else but us is trying to fix this problem. Um, and one of the, I guess, the, one of the cool quotes, I guess not cool, I guess depressing quotes um, <laughs> in this uh, was this line. Uh, so the first issue was put out in 1992. And so since 1992, with the exception of stabilizing the stratospheric ozone layer, remember in the late 80s, early 90s, we had the hole starting to develop in the ozone layer. So that, that kind of fixed, that, or that kind of went away a little bit, right? Um, so other than that, uh, humanity has failed to make uh, sufficient progress in generally solving these foreseen environmental challenges, challenges. And alarmingly, most of them are getting far worse. Uh, and so, okay, with that, I'm gonna step back off the soapbox because uh, I don't need to, to, to say on that all night. And I'm gonna kind of wrap up my talk here. And so I, I started out in the tall grass prairies near Eau Claire and looking at how fungal diversity may mediate uh, plant diversity responses and plant productivity in response to nitrogen. I then kind of transitioned to these uh, kind of montane systems and looked at how uh, AMF communities might promote the resistance and resiliency uh, within ecosystems to uh, nitrogen addition and plant biodiversity losses. 
And finally, you know, this idea that fungi may help for a while, uh, but really it's up to us to change, change how, how things are going. Um, and, and with that, um, I'm gonna finish up and I'd be happy to take any questions. Great, I am going to come around with a microphone just as a way of sort of moderating the flow of questions. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, <laughs> All right. And I guess I should, I should lead. Um, so I'm not that doom of a gloom person. <laughs> I'm sorry if I came off at that. I'm, I'm more of an optimist, um, except I guess with uh, climate change. Well, I have to say that... <laughs> I have to say this is the first time that I've ever had that, that question framed in that way, like, are fungi going to save us? I, that is, I hadn't thought about that before. And yeah. now we know the answer is no. Well, I mean, they <laughs> might help for a, low, a while, you know? <laughs> okay, I'm going to uh, hand you the mic right here. Uh, thank you. Um, all right, so in those mountain, in the mountain test plots, um, where you killed off the plants, you mm -hmm. defoliated them and round up them. Um, how did the fungi survive then? I mean, I mean, since they have that symbiotic relationship, doesn't that hurt the fungi not to have the plants there? Yeah, that's a really great question. And that was something I forgot to mention. And so I think that fungi are able to, so at first that's what, exactly what we thought was gonna happen is that we cut these plants out, we round up them, we would see this huge drop in, in fungal in fungal biomass production in the soils. But in real, real reality, these fungi are connected to a bunch of different plants, and so they form these kind of common networks uh, amongst multiple host plants, right? And so they're, they're kind of almost like a computer network, right, that you can connect within an office building or whatever, you can connect to multiple different computers through a cord. These fungi are the cords. Um, so if you cut out one plant, they're still able to survive on eight other plant hosts. And so through that, that kind of common network. Great. If it is possible, could I interject alfalfa as a plant? And the nodes in alfalfa that grow under the ground, have you studied any of that as a solution to our our problems. Yeah, that's a that's a really great idea because alfalfa also fix nitrogen. They have bacteria in their roots that fix nitrogen, um, and so I think I think there's a lot of really great solutions that how we could start bringing in AMF into agriculture. Uh, we don't really do it in this country at all right now. Um, so, uh, Af uh, Europe and Asia are a lot more advanced in that, uh, but they also go to kind of a no-till. Right, so if, if we wanna keep these fungi in the system and keep them doing their thing, we just don't till it. We just cut everything off at the base and then re replant on top of it. Um, and so the tilling is, is huge. And then if we stop tilling, then we can stop dumping nitrogen and other nutrients on the system because these fungi essentially are doing the same job as a lot of the fertilizers. Um, and I think one of the major problems in winter is the, the when we cut off the, the cover crop, you know, corn or, or whatever, we don't plant anything on top of that. So yeah, if you, could, if you could get alfalfa to grow through the winter, I think that'd be really nice. But I think the rotation between like alfalfa and other kind of nitrogen fixing plants help keep, keep some of the nutrients in the ecosystem. I was just curious, you said there's trees that coexist more with AMF and trees that don't? Yeah. And so I'm curious what are some and why other trees don't? Yeah, so some, uh, some, some plant or some tree species um, associate with ectomycorrhizal fungi. And so they're kind of a competing mycorrhizal group. Um, and so things like oak, um, oh man, this is really hard to be put on the spot, um, <laughs> oak, and all, all the pines associated with ectomycorrhizal fungi. And so those are fungi that will produce your classic mushrooms. Um, and they don't live inside the plant root, so they, they wrap hyphae around the outside of, of roots. And so AM trees, um, they're these fungi, but they're kind of sugar, they're sugar maples, uh, black walnuts, um, uh, tulip poplars, which I don't think tulip poplars grow this far north. Um, uh, yeah, some of the softer, some of the softer woods associate with AM, and so, and some trees go both, associate with both, and so 
uh, aspens and um, aspens and um, cottonwoods can associate with both AM and ectomycorrhizal fungi, and so can willows. Willows can do can associate with both, and so they have one or the other. There's no there's no tree that associates with n nothing. Yeah. Is there a way to you know seed the soil with so to speak with these fungi? Yeah, there's there's a few companies that are starting to produce uh, inoculums that you can add to restoration, right? And so the 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 work that I presented here um, from the stuff on Eau Claire, it originally started as a restoration experiment. Um, so if we can use use AM fungi within more of a restoration framework, and I've I've done a few other projects that have used actually translocated. Um, fungal inoculum from remnant intact prairies into, into new restorations and actually improves the growth of plants and it actually helps out a lot. Uh, but mo you have to be really aware of what company that you're buying uh, your fungal propagules from or your inoculum um, because a lot of companies are just kind of selling you garbage, <laughs> um, unfortunately. Um, just because they're easier to, to propagate. Um, and so there's only a handful of companies that are selling you real, like beneficial fungi. So my question is, are there any plants that get by without fungi? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, sedges and a lot of aquatic plants don't really associate with, with fungi. Um, just the, the aquatic environment is pretty rough on, on fungi. Yeah. But yeah, a lot of sedges in, uh, sedges in a lot of aquatics. That's the only, the only two I can really think of off the top of my head. Yeah, <laughs> most of them do though. So what about uh, farming methods? Are there different farming methods that would preserve the fungi? Yeah, I think if we went to like a no-till system um, I think that would be really beneficial. So a lot of European farming and a lot of, um, I think Chinese farmers have started adopting more of a no-till. Um, the problem is to buy all the new technology that would require, that's required to go to a no-till system is very different and it's very expensive um, compared to what, you know, how farmers, you know, farmers have equipment that has been passed down and used for a really long time. And so forcing farmers that are already kind of scraping by to buy all new equipment and infrastructure is, is really tough. Um, but a lot of the no-till systems, they're, they're expensive up front, but they're a few pieces of equipment that all kind of hook together. They've, they've actually pushed that technology. It's, re it's really great. Um, and then I think just keeping more cover crops on on systems are gonna be really beneficial too. So one of the things that also hurts fungi is if they have no host for eight months of the year and they only have corn growing on them for about two months and then they're, it's slashed again. And so that other 10 months of the year or nine months of the year, they really have nothing to associate with. And so it's also really bad. And so if we, if we do more crop rotations quickly, I think that also will help out a lot. Um, can I ask you just a little bit, if you know, about the technology, new technologies mm -hmm. for no-till? Because I guess when I think of no-till, I think, you know, hearkening back to before tractors and plows. Mm -hmm. And as you're talking about new technologies, you know, shepherding in a no-till era, maybe, mm -hmm. I'm wondering what those look like. Yeah, so the, the way, the few I've seen, it's just... Um, they're like these really cool kind of cedars that will kind of punch a hole into the soil and simultaneously will drop a seed into the system. And so it just kind of looks like a big rolling kind of spike wheel that just rolls over the top of the soil and just kind of punches holes and drops, drops seeds in. So now I have to ask about soil compaction. Yeah. Is that, you know? Yeah, it's also a huge, huge okay. issue with AMF too. And so... I think some of the, yeah, so that's also a huge problem. Okay. Yeah. Stanley. Changing gears for a second. Yeah. What, what opinion do you have of GMOs? Uh, no opinion. Um, I think, you know, they're, I think what they are, you know, I think every, every crop that we grow is a GMO at some level, right? So 
they, we've just sped up the the speed of which we have GMOs now. So now we can instead of doing it, you know, harvesting and saving only the seeds that were really beneficial for hundreds of years, uh, we can now just go into the the DNA and pinpoint of what we want, um, and we can pick out the traits of that we want in the landscape. Um, and so yeah, so I think good bad. I don't know. Yes, it depends. It depends on the the technology that's added into them, right? So some some of the things with uh, you know some of the like the I guess Roundup Ready stuff is it, what scares me about it um, about the like Roundup Ready stuff is that now Monsanto control or some big corporations kind of control the all the the whole product, right? So they'll sell you the seed, and then they'll sell you the fertilizer, and then they'll sell you the Roundup, and then they'll, but that, and you have to buy licenses every year on it. So that is what is a little scary to me. GMOs in in general don't really scare me. It's just like it's the the corporate the corporate scariness. Monopoly. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. And intellectual property. And yeah, exactly, exactly. Question right here. As a backyard vegetable grower is there something I should take home with me from this yeah I think uh, I think it would be really great uh, you because you can uh, you can start trying to incorporate some of these fungi into your garden right says do you do some do you ro rototill every year or do you just kind of loosen up the soil a little bit I uh, don't rototill I've got uh, raised beds yeah, so I think I think if you if, you know you could look into bringing some of these fungi in your system, and you probably get better yields and and more growth on a lot of your vegetable plants. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and maybe less need to to fertilize. If, I'm not sure if you fertilize or do any of that, mm -hmm. and and your plants will also be able to withstand maybe some 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 pathogens and and you know different insects that feed on them. Um, so these fungi kind of help plants kind of better tolerate that that kind of stuff. Back to my question about incorporating maybe some of them. Uh, my sister and I just um, signed a contract to put some land into to conservation. Mm -hmm. The same thing. <laughs> and uh, you know, you ha we were just going to um, contract with the com these companies that you know come up with a different biodiversity in the seed that you have to put on there. And um, but I, you know, no one ever talked about you know. Is there mm -hmm. any? You know, would they know what I was talking about if I said, hey, do you know anything they about should. this? They should. Oh, they yeah. should. If they're doing a lot of grassland restorations, they should know about mycorrhizae. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. But the but I, I, um, contracts probably don't, the state or the, the government probably doesn't require that, but I suppose it would be extra, extra to have them do that, too. Oh, maybe. absolutely. Yeah. 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 I know. If, are you doing a grassland restoration? Um. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's whatever the combination we were going to oh, yeah, maybe yeah. throw some extra flower, wildflowers in. Yeah, yeah, for totally, the, totally. For the, okay, yeah, yes. yeah, like a tall grass prairie kind yeah, of restoration. Yeah. So one of the companies, thing. one of the companies that I know really well that does um, some of these uh, kind of um, fungal kind of culture mixes that they tailor towards your climate and to the growing conditions is a company called Mycobloom. They're out of, uh, I think, I think she just moved from uh, Indiana to Lawrence, Kansas, but she's out of Kansas, um, and she she has a collection of, of different fungi that she will tailor towards um, your your area that you're growing in. Is an uh, invasive fungus a thing? Can you get inoculate your soil with stuff that is non-native, which will cause problems for your native plants? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question, um, and so uh, so the the a lot of the corporate um, in fungal inoculum that is out there, that's kind of what it is. It's just kind of like weedy stuff that they can get to grow really easy, um, and yeah, I don't know if we, we really know enough about invasive fungi. Um, yeah, that's not an area that many people think about. Yeah, oh yeah, it's definitely possible. It's absolutely possible. And so the the fungi that um, um, the that mycobloom cells it, actually they are extracted originally from uh, remnant tall grass prairies around the Midwest. And so she goes and just collects different fungal communities from those different remnant prairies. So they're they have a single stage of life. They're always mycelial. 
Yeah, yeah, yep. And they produce asexual spores. And so there's no there's no sexual reproduction in those in, in AMF. Where are the spores produced? Uh, so they just they will just grow at the end of the hyphae. Yeah. And they usually get cued in, so they usually start producing spores at the end of the growing season. So as the as plants are starting to slow down their their photosynthesis and their the amount of carbon that they're paying them. They will. They kind of have, I guess, evolved to to know that the, the winter is coming, and so they'll just kind of spore up and wait for next spring. And the spores are just a genetic storage bank to weather the, the freeze or whatever. Yeah, and so it's a, it's so these these fungi. So fungi are weird. They don't travel anywhere. Yeah, yeah. They they can't really travel. Well, some some spores will get eaten by mice and voles and other. Th- things that live in and earthworms and other things that live in the soil and so they can get moved kind of short distances but they're kind of restricted to the soil and so unless they're getting physically carried out they're not moving Um, and so fungi are a little bit different than what we know about plants and animals and so their fungal spores especially amf spores will have are polynucleate so they have like thousands of different nuclei in in an individual spore which is a little different than way we work or our plants work. And so they, yeah, so they have a tremendous amount of fungal diver- or diversity in their, in their genes, um, but it's just not from sexual reproduction. Thank you very much, Jeremiah, for being here. We really appreciate all the work that you did to put this presentation together for us. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope folks that are traveling have safe, easy travels. We'll see you next month. Thank you.